This is the Natural History Museum. Welcome to NHM Live. In a couple of minutes, you'll be meeting one of our scientists. This is your chance to ask some questions directly. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's find out who our scientist is today. My name is Steph West. I am UK Biodiversity Training Manager and I work within the Angela Marmont Centre for UK Biodiversity at the Natural History Museum. Currently, I work in partnership with the National Biodiversity Network Trust and Field Studies Council, running a lottery-funded project called Identification Trainers for the Future. Our trainees join us for a 12-month work-based traineeship in UK species identification, focusing on some of the less well-known groups of plants and invertebrates. And crucially, we also teach them how to communicate with the wider public and natural historians across the UK. I have been a field natural historian for as long as I can remember, having always been fascinated by the wildlife around us. Ever since seeing bats on a school trip, I've been hooked on this fascinating species group, but my interest in British wildlife is far wider, and I'm just as happy identifying plants with a hand lens, insects with a sweet net, a microscope, or birds with binoculars. I love my job because through teaching I've discovered that the thing I enjoy most is inspiring and enthusing others about the diversity and spectacle that is the wildlife on our doorstep. Hello, welcome to NHM Live. I'm David, your host for today's show, and I'm joined by ecologist Steph West. And as you can probably tell, we've had a bit of a change of scene. We're out the studio, we're outside the museum in the beautiful wildflower meadow here, just outside the museum. And today we are looking at garden biodiversity. So what you can find in your own gardens, where to look, and why we should care as well. So send in your questions if you want to find out about what you can find in your garden, or maybe you found something interesting yourself and you want to share it with us. So I can see, well, I can hear Steph. Um, some of the birds are singing, yeah. as well as the London traffic coming past. I can see there's a few things flying around already, but if we really want to find something a bit less obvious in the garden, where should we look? Okay. Well, I'm going to take you over towards the log piles that we've got set up in the garden. They've been okay. here for quite a while. Um, so they're a really important habitat and where we can find some of our most interesting species in the garden. So if we walk over this way. Yeah, let's go this way. Yes. It's very dark over there. It we'll is a little okay. bit. Right, we'll okay. You lead the way and I'll, I'll sure. follow. Okay. Okay. So log piles and are these natural or are these actually being put here intentionally? No, so these have been put here deliberately um, yep. to try and um, provide habitat opportunities for a whole variety of different species. So we've got a whole host of different types of log piles that we can create. It's not just necessarily a big pile of fallen logs but actually thinking about standing up some of that timber, putting brash piles in together can bring uh, in a whole host of different types of wildlife. So log piles not just the log pile, there are different no. types of log piles. Yeah, there are. Okay well let's have a look at some of the stuff. You've been busy collecting today. We have. Uh, yeah. What have you found for us? What are the sort of animals that would live in a log pile? Okay, so there's a whole host of different animals that can live in different types of log piles, but I'm going to start you off with my favourite species that we found today. Excellent. Um, so if I just try and tip this one out, it's a big <laughs> it's pile of dirt. It's not going to hurt you, but it is quite large. If I just try and tip him out, hopefully he's still it's hiding. tucked away. There oh, he there is, down at the Fantastic. bottom. Oh, so yeah. we'll just tip him out. Actually. It is quite large. Not the largest one of this type of thing that we could find, but this is a lesser stag beetle. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so this is the lesser beautiful. stag beetle. I'm guessing there's a greater stag beetle. There is beetle a greater stag beetle. beetle. So that's the one which a lot of people have heard about, the greater stag beetle, which is the really large one with the the males have a big, huge uh, pincers on the front. Uh, but this is the lesser one, which is the one that we get in our grounds here, um, which I think is rather special as well. So that spends its entire life cycle in dead wood piles. So it hunts, it lives, and it breeds in dead wood piles. So, so without dead wood like this, these log piles... There wouldn't be we a wouldn't home, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't have stag beetles. Yes, yeah, so this okay. really does a dead wood habitat specialist. Excellent. What else? Because it's not just stag beetles, is it's it? It's not it's just like stag beetles. It's like a whole city in the log piles, yes. isn't it? Yeah, there's You've a whole host. found a few other things. What have we got? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start off with some of our detritivores. So these are some of the things that are helping to break down the dead wood. So these need dead wood to live. Is that what detritivore means? Yes. Right, okay. Yeah, so they break down some of our dead wood habitat. So we've got a few different things in here. Uh -huh. um, we've got a whole little pile of wood lice yeah, in there. Yeah, we've got a bundle so a of wood lice there, absolutely. There. Yeah. What about this one? That's, that's that's that so, so, yeah, so th what do you think that is? Oh. Oh. Um, that to me looks like a millipede, but I wasn't sure we had those That's in the right. UK. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, so this is the white-legged snake millipede. Um, so all of these are just 
burrowing away, feeding on some of the fungi that's breaking down the dead wood. Uh -huh. um, and important part of our habitat, actually taking away some of that um, dead wood pile. So They're really like important. The recyclers, aren't they? They are. They're yes. carrying out an important job. Yes. We've really got a question come through, which is wonderful. Thank you. Um, Alison Smith wants to know that if the lesser and greater stag beetles are different species. They are yeah. different species, yeah, which is absolutely right. So there can be a little bit of confusion sometimes with the female um, greater stag beetle and the lesser stag beetle because they can look a little bit similar, but the greater stag beetle looks completely different. And yeah, they are different species. Excellent. And the London Wildlife Trust are actually, they're interested in people's uh, recording these yes, as well. Yes, yes. So they really want people's records. So if you're in London and you happen to find a greater stag beetle, uh, London Wildlife Trust really want to hear from you. Excellent. OK, so we've got some stag beetles. We've got the detritivores. Yeah. Are there anything else that people might find? Yeah, well, of course, as soon as we start to get anything in, um, any wildlife into this kind of habitat, we then get our predators coming in as well. Excellent, my favourite. Um, so we've got a bit of a brute here, and he may move a little bit fast, so I'm not sure how long he's going to last on my hand for, but this one is venomous. Um, but okay, I'm, I'm going to step back. <laughs> you're okay, you're fine. So you um, haven't got gloves on or anything? No, it's totally fine I'm not particularly worried about this. I mean, it's only really if I was another insect, I might be worried, but you can see him just running around quite quickly there. Doesn't want to get out, there. does it? Doesn't want to get out. He might. Oh, I don't think he likes me. There Whoa. we go. Oh, gosh, live one. There we go. So he's just running around yeah, on the back of my hand fast. there. Very, very fast. <laughs> Is that how it Perfectly catches adapted. prey? Right. Yep, absolutely. So really, really quick, speedy little insect there. But venomous predator, a really, really fantastic predator within this habitat. So that's an example of a food web that we've got there. Yes. You know, we've got lots absolutely. of different things. There. And we've got another question. This is from Periscope this time. Raisa, apologies if I've got that one wrong, um, wants to know, oh, people love stag beetles. They want to know about <laughs> yes, stag beetles. Do. How many stag beetles can live on one log? I want an exact number. Oh, <laughs> I'm not going to give you an exact number. <laughs> I can't give you an exact number. Um, you can sometimes find, particularly you can find larval um, stag beetles in reasonable numbers, um, okay. but I'm not going to give you an exact number. There. No, I'm, I'm being mean. There. But <laughs> the, the thing is, even if people don't have much space in their garden, yeah. maybe not enough for a tree, yeah. Actually, putting a little bit, a few logs there is better. Than yes, nothing, definitely. Yeah, okay. and but just thinking about putting in some standing deadwood, yeah. as well as just lying flat on the ground deadwood, it makes a really big difference. Top tip there. Okay, well, we've looked at deadwood. Um, let's have a look at some live wood, yeah. some trees. <laughs> let's pop down because obviously there's sure. plenty around the museum. There here. are. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah, as well as deadwood, obviously living trees are vitally important um, for wildlife. And you, can, you don't necessarily just immediately have to look for the insects themselves. You can actually just look for evidence um, of insects on the trees. Um, so what sort of things are we talking about? These are like clues that something's yeah. been So here. some of the most obvious examples of that might be looking for some of the damage that um, insects will cause as they're either mining through the leaf or just eating their way through it. So you can see just some different examples of, of some of the evidence you might find. What do you mean by mining the leaf? They're not, it's not hi-ho, hi-ho stuff, <laughs> no, is it? No, so they're not there with <laughs> drills or anything like that. Um, they're actually just eating their way through through inside the leaf. So you can find these little trails of where they've been. And okay. sometimes if you're very lucky, you can find the insect themselves. Excellent. And we got, we've got one more question about stag beetles that we're going to quickly <laughs> take. You can see this is, we should have done the whole show on stag beetles. <laughs> um, Adam on Facebook wants to know if you can find stag beetles everywhere in the UK. Great question, actually. Yes, yeah, so they are quite dis quite widely dispersed across yeah. England and Wales, um, but you do really need to be looking in that deadwood habitat. London does seem to have quite a few of them, mm -hmm. um, and where people are looking, it tends to be more a case of people actively looking for them tend, tend to find them. Okay. So um, and they can turn up in gardens, they can turn up in parks, um, and other places uh, and that people will be. Just because there's no records in somewhere doesn't mean that they're, they're not there. Absolutely. So you know, there's Always no harm in looking. And, and tell the London Wildlife Trust as well. Okay, well, we've seen on our tree some evidence mm -hmm. that there's things living on it, or feeding on it at least. Yeah. What have we actually found? Because I know you've okay. you collected some things earlier. Yeah, so we've been looking on some of the leaves and some of the bark to see what we might find. Um, we found a few um, leaf beetles. Ooh, so look. these are some of my favourites. They're very, very pretty. They're going to grip onto this uh, pot quite hard um, so we've just got uh -huh. one of them out there wow, I think these pretty. these are absolutely beautiful our leaf beetles um, fantastic just um, to watch what are they doing on the tree are they just living there or are they feeding so yeah well? so in this species they're, they're feeding on on the leaves um, but you'll find them quite nicely just tucked in and amongst the leaf um, so really kind of tucked into some of the corners on the leaves as they fold up um, so that's always a nice place to look um, and then We've also got, sticking with the, the beetle theme, Okay. obviously. More beetles, um, not too many beetles. The very recognisable ladybird. I know that one. And that's a two-spot ladybird, It is a two-spot ladybird, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Identified by the two spots on it. <laughs> um, but very similar species group, so it's still within our beetles. Uh -huh. um, but you don't just find the adults. 
um, on trees. And here we've actually got the pupa of, looks a bit like an alien. It does. So this is the pupa of a, of a ladybug. Yes. And that's one yeah. thing that a lot of people aren't actually aware of, is that these beetles go through this metamorphosis, this change, mm -hmm. just like butterflies, yeah, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Wow. So actually looking for the larval stages and the pupal stages of, of beetles and other insects can be really really fascinating as well they look completely different and it's but it's a good point as well that actually when you're providing habitat in your garden for species it's not just the adults that you've got to think about it's the, the larval forms as well and sometimes they might have different needs as well yes and they might move between different parts of the habitat so that's why getting diversity of lots of different types of habitats if you can get it into yeah. your garden is really important to what support if, all those life stages what if people have got very small garden maybe they've got room for one tree should we say is there if someone wanted to plant a tree is there one tree which is like the super tree for, for UK <laughs> biodiversity? If you really want to get as many species as possible on one tree, yeah. oh, you need to go for something like an oak tree. However, if you've got a really <laughs> small garden, I wouldn't recommend small you do it. Tree. Yeah, <laughs> I really wouldn't recommend you put that in your tiny little plot of land. Um, so, I mean, oak trees themselves can have two to three hundred species of insects just, just living on just the one tree, wow, which is fantastic. But actually, if you really want to get all the different species in, you need to think about having smaller trees, a few little scrubby patches, right the way down to some of the grassland habitats as well. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to have a look at the grassland habitat um, a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. Thank you for uh, your questions. We've just got another one coming in from Tenex that asks, what's the largest beetle in the UK? People always want to know what the biggest and the smallest <laughs> is. The stag, stag beetles are pretty big. Is there anything bigger Great than them? No, that, that, is, that is our, our biggest beetle. Um, but there are some others which are a, a similar sort of size. Yeah. Um, so one of the species of beetle you might find flying around at the moment is the maybug um, or the cockchafer. And that's one which bumbles around very, very loud beetle you might hear at night um, does come to light. So a lot of people see it coming okay. to their kitchen window or something like that, and bumping how, into the how grass. How big would something like a cockchafer be? Um, I haven't got an example with me, but um, you're talking something about that that sort of size. So a decent sized beetle. That you know. uh, they're not very good flyers either. I they're once awful. had one smash me in the head once. Yeah. It was yeah. quite painful. I do quite a lot of moth trapping and they're, they're always flying around here hitting you as, as you're doing that too. <laughs> well, we've had a look at uh, log piles. We've had a look at obviously the trees here, but if you really want biodiversity in your garden, one place that you've got to look is actually freshwater yeah. pond. And we were very lucky, Steph and I, to explore uh, the depths of the museum's pond earlier this week to see what we could find. So take a look. Right, Steph, I am ready to go. Let's go and explore this pond, see what we can find. Well, I like the enthusiasm there, David, but you're not going to need your mask and snorkel today. We're not no? going in the pond. No. Ah, well, that's just as well, because I'm not a very good swimmer. <laughs> Uh, so how are we going to explore this <laughs> pond then and see what we find? What we're mostly going to be using today is nets and buffle traps. Okay, um, So Great. nets to take out invertebrates, so we're going to be using that to sweep around in the pond and see what's swimming around in there. And is this what, what the ID trainees are doing over there? That's right, yes. Yeah. So cool. we've got Alex, Laura, Matt and Steph over there doing a bit of um, pond dipping for us already. Okay, um, so how so does that work from start to finish? Well, if you want to go and pond dip, what do you need to do? Well, as you be simple, so we're using quite a sturdy um, pond net um, today, uh, which will just help us just to get through the vegetation quite quite easily. Um, so you want to make sure that you don't just tickle around on the water surface. You've got to get actually into the pond and actually get through the vegetation. That's where you're going to find the best insects uh, when you're looking at a pond. Um, and then we're simply just going to tip that out into one of our white trays um, and then look and see what see what we've got. The ID trainees have been busy pond dipping and um, yep. using the nets for a while now. So I think we should go and check out and see if they found anything interesting. Steph, the first thing you notice is there's loads of things. Yeah. Once it's settled down, you start noticing all this movement, all these sort of things coming out of the vegetation, which is, which is really surprising. Um, I almost don't know where to start, but perhaps you can talk us through a few of the things that people might find in their own ponds. Okay, sure. Um, so one of the things you might have noticed is that I haven't thrown out all of these large sticks over here. Yeah, I um, didn't think much of those to be honest, but are you going to tell me they're a bit more interesting? They are, they're very interesting. So these are cased caddisfly larva. Um, and they actually, there's a, there's a caddisfly hiding away, and we've got three of them in here, um, just tucked away right in the end in there. And they build these structures out of the substrate from the pond. So we can see here we've got one which has used some quite large stones in there, um, and a few sticks. We've got one here that's even involved a few old snail shells. Um, constructing why place. are they doing that? Is that for protection? 
yeah, yeah. essentially it can protection camouflage as well so they can just sit on the bottom of the pond and mostly be ignored until they're ready to hatch out great well now i've got a camera here so we're going to get some nice sort of close-up shots in case people anyone's wondering what this is what are these things scooting around really quickly that they've okay got on so the we've surface? got quite a few things zipping around and um, we've got a um, few water boatmen over mm -hmm. here, if I just pull him in a little bit, you can oh, see yeah. him just starting to swim. <laughs> and then we've got quite a few of those in there, which are lovely to see. Um, those are beetles, aren't they? Yes, that's right, they're beetles. Um, and then we've got one of my, actually, I have to admit, one of my favourites, uh, which is water hoglouse, freshwater water hoglouse. So that's, um, well, you can see just, just from looking at it, it's very similar to a woodlouse. It, I was going to say it looks exactly, yeah. so that's a crustacean as well. So it's yeah. not just insects that we've got. No, 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 there's all sorts of things. Oh, there's something that. wriggling around <laughs> yeah. uh, here. So, so it, that's a leech. I was going to say that looks like a leech. Yes. Now that might surprise a lot of people that, that we've got leeches yeah. in Britain. What people might notice is, you know, midges, um, caddis flies, mayflies or dragonflies, whatever. These are things that people are familiar with, but only in the adult form. Yes. This is like the hidden part of their life that you don't normally Absolutely. get to see. And it's why ponds are so important, because they, they form such a vital component of these animals' life cycles. So they need water to be able to breed and bring on the next generation. That's great. Well, we've also got a very healthy pond in the museum's garden, um, but even in a very small pond that you might have in your own garden, hmm. you can find a lot of these things. Absolutely, yeah. And it's Brilliant. why ponds are quite such an important feature of gardens. You can fit a pond in. In terms of bringing wildlife into your garden, it's one of the quickest and easiest ways to do it. Welcome back. Here we are, still in the uh, wildflower meadow just outside the museum, where I'm joined by Steph West, our ecologist here at the museum. Thank you for all your questions that have been coming in as we've been exploring garden biodiversity. So far, we've, we've looked at log piles, we've looked at trees, um, but we've had a question come through, um, which is... Um, if there are any other habitats suitable for insects. This question's come from BB164. It says that they've got a bug hotel, which is great, well done. But are there any other habitats that are suitable for insects? Okay, so one of the things that people um, have often in their garden is, of course, lawns. But what can be really important is actually letting some of that lawn grow. So uh, it doesn't have to be the whole thing, obviously, but as you can see here in the meadow, um, by is, allowing this to grow... It's not been mowed for a while, this one. It's not been mowed for a while, um, although we do have sheep on it at some point. Oh, fantastic. Museum sheep. Yes. Um, now, obviously, some of this has been seeded deliberately to try and bring through a few more wildflowers, but uh -huh. actually just letting a small patch of your lawn grow a bit longer can bring in so many more insects into the garden. And what is it specifically? Is it is it the shelter? Or is it? I mean, there's lots of flowers here. It's is that a real mixture. Things? So the flowers do play a really important part, but actually the structure of having that longer grass and therefore the different microclimates and different microhabitats within that structure right. is very important. Excellent. Okay, and we've got another question. Um, someone uh, on Facebook this time, Christine Taylor. Um, <coughs> really good question, actually. I like this one. Are there any damselfly or dragonfly nymphs in the pond? Uh, Yes, there, yes are. there are. We didn't see any, did we, the other we, day? We but. didn't actually get any the other day, um, but we do have damselflies uh, flying around the wildlife uh -huh. garden. So, yes, it's a great question. And, yes, we do have the predatory larva um, in the pond. We just didn't happen to get them uh, when we for were looking for For people that maybe don't know, but would you be able to quickly tell us um, why they're so interesting? They're so, they are, you talked about them being predators. They're yeah. almost terrifying. They, are, they really, they? really are. Yeah. If you were tiny um, and faced with a da uh, dra dragonfly or damselfly larva, you could be in quite a lot of trouble. Um, one of the things that I really like about them is actually the mask. So that's the bottom of their jaw, which they can actually fire out and drag in their prey. And the um, dragonfly larva jet around um, using uh, literally water jets. Uh, so you can see them just darting around really, really fast in the water. Voracious predators, they're great fun. And if you find one, it's normally a good sign of a healthy pond, Yes, isn't absolutely. It? it means there's lots of things there for them to hunt. Excellent. Well, back to our, our, our meadow. Mm. Uh, there's lots of flowers here. Flowers... Yeah are going to attract lots of insects as well. Yeah, What's the sort of relationship between insects and, and flowers? Okay, so of course pollination is a subject which a lot of people know a bit about. Yeah. Um, and we've got an awful lot of pollinators coming to the flowers in the wildflower meadow. Um, so some of the commoner ones um, that people will recognise are some of our bee species. Uh -huh. um, so we've got here Bombus pascorum and some of our Andrina species that we picked up earlier on during the day. Um, but actually... People think about bees as the sole pollinator of a lot of our plants, and they 
they are important, absolutely, but they're not the only pollinators that we might find. Um, so we might find beetles pollinating plants, flies particularly play a really important role in pollination as well. Okay, All what sort of, of things. flies are we talking about? What are the important fly pollinators? Oh gosh, there's so many of them, um, but the ones that a lot of people might see and might actually even mistake for, uh, for bees are one of my favourites, the bee fly, uh, which Excellent. is a really cute little fuzzy little thing. And you actually earlier with, your, with the sweep net, mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know what I'm doing with this. <laughs> <laughs> but what you do, thankfully, and you were collecting lots of things earlier today, yeah. and you found some, some real treats, actually. Perhaps we could take a yeah. look at a few that you well, found. Well, I'm going to pull out my favourite um, that we found uh, today, which is this one here, um, which hopefully I'm not about to let let's go. Hold it steady, that's it. <laughs> so I'll try and hold that as steady as I can. Wow, that's, now, that's enormous. Yes. And straight away, I instinctively sort of backed away because it, it looks like a hornet. It does. It looks yeah. exactly like a hornet, but it's not. This is actually a fly. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the hornet mimic hoverfly. Um, so be a beautiful mimic of the hornet, but itself completely harmless to us okay. um, and actually completely harmless to, to other things as well. It actually lives in the bottom of wasp nests um, and is actually a bit of a cleaner. Um, okay. So cleans up the detritus around the bottom of wasp, ne wasp nests. Oh, yeah. That's his job. Yes. I like, I like the, yeah. that way of thinking about insects. And a, they've almost got these jobs within the yeah. ecosystem, haven't they, yeah. to, to carry out. We've got a, a nice question that's come in from Rachel. Um, oh, we actually answered it a little bit. Are there any bees in the museum? So the, you've mentioned a few different mm. species of bees, but we've actually got honeybees, haven't we? In the yes, museum? we do. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah. So in the grounds, we do have honeybees as well. So they're busy out, um, obviously, using the meadow as well as, as part of their uh, collection. So, yeah, we've, we're lucky. Uh, we've got quite a high diversity of bees um, across the grounds, mm. and you can find an amazing array of bees um, in a lot of habitats where you get good pollinating plants. That's the key to. thing, isn't it? The pollinating yeah. plants. Yeah. And of course, bees are our key pollinators. And mm. we had stag beetles that everyone was interested in before. Now it looks like bees are what people <laughs> are really keen on. So um, we've got uh, a question that's come in from Periscope, which is, are bees really on the decline worldwide? Because we've been talking about mm. biodiversity a lot. But actually, abundance, the number of insects, is yeah. also really important. Are we yes, seeing a big drop in numbers yeah, so of insects? With some species, yes, we are seeing a, a real drop-off and a real decline. Okay. Um, obviously, we need people to actually be able to identify um, the different types of bees. People think about, oh, yeah, bees are in decline, and think of, typically, actually, are thinking of the honeybee. Yeah. Um, but the bees are a very, very diverse group, and actually understanding um, some of the species' interactions within it's really important. So, okay. yeah, but there are some bees in quite significant decline. Okay, yeah, and it, it, it's a, a general, a genuine sort of concern, and I guess yeah. a lot of it's loss of habitat as well. Loss of habitats, yeah, particularly. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we've got some, uh, a big specimen case here, and we've got a few more specimens to look at. And yeah. one thing that we've not touched on is actually biodiversity at night time. Yeah. Because it's not, not all the insects go to sleep. No. They? There's still lots going on. Yeah. Um, and I think most people can probably tell these are moths, aren't they? So, yes. So yeah. are these ones from the museum garden? Um, so these are some of, in the tray, we've got some examples of some of the things that we might find at this time of year. Um, but we have got a few that we've picked up. We've actually got um, some day flying moths oh, uh, really? that we managed to find. Um, so oh, this is a uh, six spot burnet moth, uh, which is really, really beautiful. And a moth uh, rather than butterfly, even though it comes out during the day. Mm -hmm. um, so that one really is uh, particularly spectacular. And you'll find that in grass. And uh, we actually found that one sitting on knapweed um, ah. earlier on. Um, and this is our herald moth, um, which is another one that you can find. And actually, you can find this one over winter um, quite often um, in hibernating in sheds and garages and, and that sort of habitat as well, okay. which is really nice. It's um, not something that people think about, but actually, insects, many insects need a space to overwinter mm, as well. Something yeah, like the log piles are perfect. Yeah. Uh, we've got lots of questions coming in, Steph. Okay. And, and an interesting one, actually, from, from Ro on Facebook. And he's asking, why is the wildlife garden being changed? So there are plans to do some changes in the wildlife garden. Yeah. He wants to know um, what the sort of steps are to make sure that, obviously, we were talking about biodiversity, yes. that that's not um, affected. Yeah. Um, yeah, so change is part of part of gardens um, and gardens do change over time um, in our case we are we are looking at, at changing and modifying our, our garden habitats here hopefully to, to expand some of those habitats and make them even better and bring in even more wildlife and what's the most important thing when any change is happening to, to make sure that there isn't much damage changes to understand what you've got okay um, so we're, we're actually doing a lot of surveying so all of this data that we've collected just from collecting for today yeah. is all going to go into the records for the site so we understand a little bit more about what's 
species that we have here and therefore what considerations we need to put in place when we're when we're looking at moving things around whether that's that, day-to-day changes or longer term changes gotcha so the key thing is to make informed decision with as much information yes. as possible so hopefully you can yeah, make the right yeah. decisions excellent okay well we've got lots of questions now coming i think we'll take a few more certainly um we've got a question from samantha uh, on Facebook, she says, hello, hello, <laughs> Samantha. Uh, is London home to any mini beasts that are not seen anywhere else? So there's lots of insects Ooh, here. Gosh, that's but is there anything that's only found yeah. here in the UK? So there, are, oh, so there are species which we've got very few records for, and sometimes that can be just a case of people... There are so many people here that actually we're getting really good records because there's so many people out looking for different spe- species mm-hmm. um, and just the density of the human population. And actually, the advantage we have in terms of records here is that we've got so many extremely um, good wildlife recorders here at the museum. So we do get quite a few species which haven't necessarily been found outside of London um, because we've got so many people here recording. Um, so colleagues finding things in their gardens or their home patches in London. It is quite handy having 300 odd scientists at the yeah, museum, presumably if, because obviously no one can know all of the different species, no. but there's lots. There's someone in the museum building that most of the time will know the answer yes. isn't it, to, to something that you found. Um, Hopefully by now we've sort of explored why biodiversity is important, the sort of the important jobs that a lot of insects are doing in, in, um, in our ecosystems for the benefit of us, but also just for the whole sort of planet. But um, what can people do if they think I want to improve the biodiversity just in my garden? Um, What are the steps that people can take? So there's a whole host of different things, and it really does depend on the size and scale of of garden that you might have. Um, But essentially, um, the really long term in terms of habitat management and ecology would be spatiotemporal heterogeneity ridiculously long term, I'm afraid. (laughs) Um, But actually what that means is having looking to see how much diversity both in plants but actually also in terms of the structure of plants and different types of habitats that you can possibly try and get in without overshading so you've got bits which are light with log piles in there small patches of water even tiny amounts of water can actually bring in a great diversity Um, because we need to think about the larval stages as well as the adult stages so areas of long grass not necessarily cutting all of your lawn um, putting in log piles um, putting in a little bit little bit more structure into gardens putting in the wildlife and all these little habitats in one garden add up and then when you add all these different gardens exactly. together it does actually make yeah. a difference and that it? actually makes a real difference as well thinking about perhaps what is in that wider suite of gardens so making sure that you're not cutting off your garden leaving little spaces underneath fences so hedgehogs and things can move can in between well. gardens as well is really don't important. forget the hedgehogs too, too many people forget the hedgehogs <laughs> Uh, thank you ever so much, Steph. Right. Thank you so much for all the questions that have been coming in. Uh, we're going to go on Facebook and uh, answer some of the questions we've not had time for just after this. Uh, but I think the main thing is get out, enjoy your gardens. It's good for us. It's good for your own health. And it's good for uh, the ecosystem as well to look after it. So thanks ever so much, guys. Um, we'll see you at the next NHM Live. <laughs>